Our neighborhoods are the lifeblood of our community. We live here, we work here, and of course, we play here. They shape who we are as individuals, and in turn, we are the product of our neighborhoods. Over the course of this series, we'll be visiting some of Atlantic Canada's most vibrant and exciting neighborhoods, starting right here in the good old north end of Halifax. There's a hidden gem on Goddard Street called Plan B. Now apparently they sell all kinds of strange and wacky things that I just have to see to believe. I'm sitting down with one of the founders, Reverend Bob, to find out a little bit more about this hidden gem. I have never been here my entire life. I've lived in Halifax and I've never been to Plan B. So I'm kind of uh, a Plan B virgin and I'm excited to learn a little bit about what this place is about. Welcome to the store. You're in for a treat. Plan B is a really interesting sort of shop. It's not your expected retail boutique. We're made unique because we're actually a cooperative. It's expensive getting into some of the boutiques in town. So we offer like little spaces at like nominal costs, you know, it's not a risk factor anymore to come and uh, um, sort of join the gang. Well, Bob, I think that uh, we should just jump right in and take a look at some of the strange and weird and interesting and fantastic things that you have to offer here. Oh, this is going to be fun. Right over here, we've got a full-length man's raccoon coat, about 1912. So what about this box of, uh, what's up with this box of bones here? Well, that is actually just a box of bones. And uh, we have a lot of, say, artists and craftspeople that like to use these small bits of bone in their work. And we have uh, Mr. Patches. Which one's Mr. Patches? Domestic cat right here, eh? He passed on around 1967 and uh, was done by the fellow who owned them. His kids, in turn, they, uh, they really didn't want it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go check out some more stuff, Bob. Sure. I see a bat up there on the wall. A lot of people like the, uh, the sort of goth decor, especially you know for your dining room or living room, and that's a, a freeze-dried Madagascar bat. He's in a frame about 1855, put together to create this wonderful little shadow box. So what kind of process do you have to go through to freeze-dry a bat? Well, it, it's, it's kind, of, um, kind of a bit of work, but um, luckily it's not me that has to worry about that. You just sell these great things. That's right, uh, I'm, I'm a purveyor. Yeah. <laughs> Now this, this is a rarity. This is a 50 card tabletop stereo opticon. <clears throat> An opticon? Yeah, it's a... Uh, Sounds like a transformer. This is sort of like a, what did you do before television? A little brass gear. I feel like I'm in Paris. It's pretty cool. Oh, Patty. Now we've got an um, Indian elephant tooth. Wow. Now they've only got a couple of these, and it's sort of like what we have, like all our teeth sort of as one big plate, you know? Side. Okay, this is where you actually do the munch. And there's the roots. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and I am cooking in this. I gotta take this off. <laughs> I off. bet. Yeah, I take it off. The shitar. The shitar. Yeah. Plan B. You can't beat it, guys. You gotta get down here. Had a great time here at Plan B. Got all kinds of fun stuff. Now I just gotta find some vampires and I can perform a satanic ritual. Okay, Bob, can I get you down to $10 for the stuffed cat? <coughs> Next, we spoke with Sunday Miller, Executive Director of the Africville Museum, to get a lesson in North End history. The concept is to tell the story of Africville in a meaningful way that helps people see it more than a place of poverty and a place that was a slum. People have been living in Africville since the 1700s, and we're not necessarily sure exactly what their status was, whether they were enslaved people of African descent or free. The community of Africville was the largest free black settlement outside of Africa. So that's how people got to be in Africville. Before the explosion happened in 1917, Africville was quite booming um, because there were a lot of docks and wharves down here. The people of Africa were very resilient, so a lot of them had businesses. Um, they would help offload the ships. They would 
transport people up to the hotels and different things like that. So there was a lot of industry going on. They had three corner stores. They had their own post office. Um, you know, they, they had their own school. They had their own church. I mean, they were creating a community of people that was supportive of one another. And people were quite um, successful. And then once, of course, the explosion happened, then things just sort of went downhill. The wars weren't replaced. They weren't given money to fix their homes and the things that had been damaged. Shortly after that, other things started going in. Uh, and today we would term it environmental racism. And so it was the, the prison that went in. Um, then they had a couple of infectious disease hospitals that went in. And then the last thing that they put in was the dump in 1955. And then they would see all these homes and a church right next door to this dump. And then the question was, why is that community by that dump? And so then it got out that there was a slum in Halifax. The people of Africville had been asking for water, had been asking for sewage. They weren't getting it. Now, they did run the sewer through Africville. They just didn't connect. They paid their municipal taxes. So there's some expectation that when you pay your taxes that you're going to get municipal services. And they were told that their homes were substandard. And they'd ask, finally ask, well, why are you saying that our homes are substandard? And it was because they didn't have running water and sewer. And so they said, well, give us running water and sewer. And they would say, no. And they never got it. And if they had of, they could not have called Africa a slum. And it would still be here today. When the people finally realized they had to be they had to go, but they didn't have an option. They asked the powers that be to make sure the church was the last thing that was destroyed once everybody was gone. But people weren't leaving. And so what ended up happening is the powers that be got very concerned and somewhere in 1967, near the end of that, they, um, before Thanksgiving, my understanding would be, the church was demolished, but it was not demolished during the day. So that whole sense of security was taken from them. So um, after that, it was easier to get people out. You take them off their land and you put them in places like Uniac Square. But you don't even just place them in Uniac Square. You take them there in a garbage truck. And it, it's too easy to destroy a community. And, and then how do you put it back together? I've always wanted to know how they make sausages, so I decided to meet up with my friend Fred from Ratino Charcuterie to find out just how they're made. Ratino French Cuisine uh, started it in uh, 2010 uh, with just a little uh, charcuterie section. Um, I actually started it by doing the market for three years and opened my first location just down the road in uh, 2011 and we were specializing in charcuterie, which is basically uh, processing fresh meat uh, into cure meat, so preserving it, in other words. We extended the business uh, with a kitchen table as well, which is a 26 restaurant. Operating a business uh, in an orphan uh, has been uh, very interesting and uh, very challenging at the same time. Uh, but I'm really happy to be a part of this community. So we do employ uh, local people, um, well mostly from Nova Scotia uh, in general. Uh, but we try to support the local community uh, as well, uh, if it's not necessarily through employment directly into the business, uh, we support the community by being part of some events uh, or doing donations. So we got our hands washed. All clean, yeah. And now we're, we are, uh, we're quite literally having a sausage party. So am I going to put my hands in this stuff or what? Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so uh, we're just going to mix it up essentially. Yeah, just finish to mix it up and then we're going to be stuffing it into the sausage yeah. stuff. Uh, kind of like making hamburgers. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. But basically it's a very similar process. It's ground meat and, you know, and seasoning and spices or oils depending on what you're putting. I've got a pig shoulder in my hand right now. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, a, a bit of a shoulder, I would say maybe a fifth of the shoulder yeah, right shoulder. now, yeah. And how am I doing here? You're doing great, doing great. yeah. We're gonna be uh, able to uh, stuff them into, uh, stuff the meat into the stuffer. 
All right, Stuff getting up. sausagey, folks. Let's do this. All right, so show me one of these casings, these big, these intestines. So uh, as you can see, it's like a very, very thin membrane. So for most people, having pig intestines in your fridge is probably a little strange, but, but for you, you come over to your house, there's probably a big bowl of this stuff just sitting in the fridge. There is a lot of casing in here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a ton of it. Then uh, we kind of put the meat into the stuffer, and then this part is gonna basically slide into the tip. Plump the whole thing in, or do you? Yeah, you can turn the own film and kind of shape pack it. Pack this up like a like a football. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> blue for two, blue for two. Yeah. Oh, oh. Cool. <laughs> it's getting meaty in here, folks. It's getting meaty. And then when you arrive at the end, you make a little knot. And then I'm gonna make one to show you, and then uh, there's another tube, so you can do the other one. So this is basically a full link. I'm holding a pig intestine. Slide it on there. So you see your limit a little tight, so sometimes you gotta play with the casing and move it forward a little so it comes out easier. So when you get towards to the end, like I did in here, you always wants to leave a little bit of casing towards the end. So I size two sausage, then I twist it. So I show you again, one, and then two. If you have a bit of hair pocket, you just basically fix them and it will bleed pretty easy. Push that down there, and give it a twist. In yours, for example, you get a little bit of hair, hair pocket, pocket, so this this show you right away, you see how he opens it. And then there's one there. So all you have to do, yeah, it's cut uh, between each one then, after. Okay. And then uh, they're ready to be cooked. Let's try and cut this and see if it works out for me here. Uh -oh, I made to cut that one too short. But all this works kind of made me a little hungry. <laughs> what, yes. what do you got? Should we eat some sausage? Should we eat something else? Yeah, we're gonna go up and uh, go to the restaurant and eat something. All right, to the kitchen table we go. That's right. Well, if you haven't been here already, you need to come down to Godgen Street. You need to get to the kitchen table. It is amazing. It tastes so good. And you're going to have a different experience every time. Cheers to the glass. Yeah. And thank you, uh, thank you. The north end of Halifax just has so much to offer. From the wacky wild things we found at Plan B, you're in for a treat. The true history of Africville. The, the concept is to tell the story of Africville in a meaningful way. We've seen the sights and tasted some really great food. Cool. <laughs> Getting sausagey, folks. It's clear that this close-knit community is working together to grow and to develop the future of their neighborhood.